Awesome. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, this is the uh, uh, talk on smart parking meters. Um, we're just going to run through like a, a little introduction about ourselves and move into goals of the project and then just start going. Um, my name is Joe Grand, um, also known as Kingpin. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer and hardware hacker. I live and breathe electronics. That's what I do. I build products uh, um, and invent products and license those off to companies, but I also analyze products and break products, security related things. Um, I've, been, I've been involved in the hacker community since I was very, very young. Um, and was a member of the, of the loft in Boston in the early 90s. Uh, and and we, were, we were sort of instrumental in, in this whole disclosure policy thing and how to deal with companies and, and we'd find vulnerabilities in various products and try to work with companies to get them fixed. Um, but uh, um, sometimes in, in the 2000s, it seems like that has changed a little bit and the responses from companies can sometimes vary. Uh, not necessarily always a good response. Um, but anyway, I, I enjoy looking at, at security-related products or products that incorporate some sort of security and look at them from a hardware perspective to, uh, to, to find problems. Cool. Um, I'm Jake Applebaum. Uh, I work on the Tor project as my full-time day job. Uh, we write free software. It's the largest anonymity network in the world. It's peer-reviewed, academically reviewed. It's one of the few out there that I think is really, really good and worth using. Uh, I'm kind of a cult of the dead cow person, but I don't really do anything affiliated with the CDC. They just like baptized me with Club Mate. Uh, I started the Noisebridge Hackerspace in San Francisco um, with some friends of mine. We're an anarchist collective, essentially, uh, basically dedicated to doing non-commercial, non-academic research. Uh, so it's basically just about hacking the planet and building stuff. Um, and I started the cold boot attacks with some people. We brought on Princeton and the EFF, and it was pretty great. Uh, most recently, we did the Rogue CA certificate work um, with some other notable academics like Marion Lenser and Mark Stevens. And uh, a long time ago, I worked with some CCC people to reverse file vault. And I'm generally interested in crypto stuff and looking at sort of like the fringe. It's not really, not, not really easy to classify stuff, just something kind of odd. <laughs> odd things. I'm Chris Tarnowski. I own FlyLogic. <clears throat> I basically tear apart anything that's silicon-based and uh, reverse engineer what's inside out. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> and Chris has a broken femur and a broken ankle, so uh, he might sit down at some point. <laughs> I know he feels lame for sitting down, but don't feel, Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, don't feel lame. You're not lame. <laughs> and of course, my wife calls me. Every time I give a talk, no matter where I am, she calls. So I didn't answer it this time, though. Um, all right, so we're talking about parking meters, and, and the first thing people ask is, why parking meters? Who cares? We're at a security conference. You know, Black Hat's normally focused on network applications and software and mobile phones and things that are typically considered security related. Um, but parking meters are one of these things that they've been around for a long time. They're completely taken for granted. They exist in pretty much every city um, in the country, every city in the world, and they're starting to become electronic base, which means now they are little computers, isolated computers on each pedestal, um, and they can be taken advantage of in, in a number of ways. So, and also, um, parking meter, the parking meter uh, industry is, is huge. It's a, a very, very large, um, $28 billion actually annually. So there's a lot of money at stake, and if there's money, there's going to be potential for, for fraud and abuse. Pretty much, parking meters seem like a, a great target. There's some prior research on them, and we'll talk about that. Um, but it's something that, since we, we, we both live in San Francisco, we, we're applying the motto of think globally, hack locally. <laughs> and, um, and so... Analyze locally. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so, so basically, um, we, we gave a case study a little later on about the San Francisco, uh, the existing San Francisco uh, parking meter implementation, but the goal of this, um, well, I'll, I'll get into that. Um, so not only are parking meters susceptible to financial uh, fraud, so getting free parking and you know, things like that, but there's also all sorts of social implications, possible privacy implications, legal implications. So there, there is this wide range, and it's not just one specific attack that can harm the meter. There's all sorts of things that could potentially harm society. For example, who here has ever been towed? Anybody ever been towed? Or maybe you've gotten a parking ticket and you've tried to contest it. It's like the machine is always right, and the people that are working the machines, they're also always right. And if it's a below a certain dollar amount, it's really almost not worth your time to contest it. And it kind of, to me, that's always really bothered me. So I like the idea that with this, we can raise some doubt about whether or not the machine is always right. 
And maybe you can use this to contest some parking tickets if you get them. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> among, among other things. Right. Um, so our, our goal is really, we, we started, we all started this project for different reasons and then sort of came together and, and you know, one day I realized that Jake was interested in working on parking meters and I was interested in learning about smart cards and just wanted to do something fun and Chris, of course, loves smart cards and, and uh, I'd always wanted to work with Chris. So this was a great excuse for all of us to get together. Um, but the goal is really for us as far as doing this research um, and then we'll, we'll uh, kind of get into some details of it, but really to understand the parking meter infrastructure and how parking meter systems are typically set up, what components are used, what types of meters are out there, um, demonstrate any, any attacks or problems that we could find, but also uh, um, sort of hypothesize about attacks that could be possible, because we obviously don't have uh, enough time on our, on our own to, to find every single problem with every single meter. So it's more of kind of you know scratching the surface and looking from from a high level of what can be what can be done, um, and then of course one of my favorite things is educating people about the hardware hacking process because I I love analyzing hardware and and as you'll see from the case study, the results of the case study the attack that we ended up doing is not groundbreaking at all, um, and it actually shouldn't even be possible in 2009, um, but showing the process is more important. And that's, that's really the, the goal for me is to, to try to get you guys to understand the process as far as how we looked at the entire infrastructure, how we gathered information, how we looked at the hardware, and then how we went about the process of breaking the system. Um, so you can either go and analyze products in a similar fashion or maybe take our work and realize how we thought about it to design products differently. And as we go along, you'll, you'll see some things and you'll think, oh, well, maybe they'll go into that. And that can be your area of future future research if you'd like, because there's just so many things that just will just stand out. Mm -hmm. You'll just realize that it's like, oh, they didn't think of doing that? Oh, well, how about that? Mental note. Yeah, and, and the, um, the parking meter um, industry, or the fare collection industry, it is not an industry that's typically, uh, you know, I, as far as I know, don't come to conferences like this. It's, it's an area where, you know, probably people haven't gone to them and said, here's a security problem, here's this, here's that. Um, and yeah, as we go through these, you'll see that engineers who are designing products don't necessarily understand security like we understand security. Um, so we'll look at these products and, and realize that, and we'll show you pictures. And they might not even understand some of the tools that they're working with, which can lead right. to some hilarious results. That's right. Just maybe. So. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> possibly. <laughs> um, so just in general, uh, a, a few different um, portions of the fare collection infrastructure, starting with the parking meter, um, and we will show pictures and get into, get into this a little bit more, but there's the single space parking meters that are sort of the typical one meter on a, on a stick, you know, every few feet away. Um, one meter per space. The multi-space meters are becoming more and more popular, and that would be one box for an entire block, for example. So a user would have to go to the, to the multi-space meter, um, pay for their particular spot, or print out a ticket or some sort of token that shows that they've paid the fare. Um, so two different types, and there's all sorts of interfaces that we'll get into. Uh, so you can also have things like an audit log. So this is kind of useful because for a while, um, there's been a problem, which is that uh, meter maids might be skimming cash off the top. And since they're also the person collecting the uh, money and maybe doing whatever like rudimentary audits that exist without electronics, it was thought that it would be possible for them to commit massive fraud. There have been sting operations where they've caught meter maids skimming like thousands and thousands of dollars. One meter maid was caught with like seven thousand dollars and quarters in his house. <laughs> yeah. um, and I mean, like, so it's it, you know, electronic parking meters were were trying to solve that problem, and they I don't think they solved that problem, and I think they created a bunch of new problems on top of that, um, which. You know, it, 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 it makes for a more complex system, but it's also nice, like in theory, to have roles where you can split things. You can say, this is the person that collects the audit log. They don't tamper with the log. They have no financial incentive. They can't take money out. And then you have the person that takes the money out, and they don't even know about the log. And so when you separate those, in theory, you have something great. But maybe in practice, that doesn't work out so well. And maybe in practice, you, you, you make an insider attack more valuable. Because in the case of smart cards, you might have someone inventing uh, eCash. And eCash is a really hard problem to solve, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but I think the role separation is really a key idea that got people to buy into this electronic parking meter thing, and we hope to smash a couple of those ideas a little bit. Yeah, so you know, there's one person that retrieves audit logs. If audit logs are supported, somebody to, to retrieve the coins, and then somebody to repair the meters. Not necessarily all the same, same person. Um, so parking meter technology. Um, 
in the early 1990s and, and previously, well, obviously, originally, all, all parker meters were purely mechanical based. Um, but in the early 1990s, you sort of had this mechanical electrical hybrid um, that, that took uh, coins uh, and you would physically move a knob that would dump the coin in, but then you'd have some electronics that would keep track of uh, the remaining time on the meter and possibly some sort of administrator access, reprogramming capa capabilities and things like that. Um, but now we're seeing completely electronic systems that there is no mechanical uh, portion at all, so solid state as it were. Um, where you have microprocessor, memory, user interface, all of the, the typical targets for an embedded system or for an electronic system that you're trying to break. Um, so now we can look at these things and um, go through the exact same process as we would for any other piece of electronics that has a, a microprocessor. So one of the interesting things here is that um, we, we talked about globalism in the slide title, and I think it's important to drive home. If you, if you are basing the security of your meter on some sort of idea that obscurity can result in, wow, did you just get owned? No, sorry. Oh, OK. Uh, Cron, Cron ran. And Apple crashed. Uh, Apple crashed, OK. Uh, so if you're, wow, I lost my train of thought. Anyway, if you're, if you're, basing, uh, if you're basing this uh, idea of security on obscurity, well, you can't hope that your police will be able to keep all the meters safe. Because you can buy meters on eBay, right? And they'll be made by the same company. And they might differ in some way. But the general architecture is going to stay the same because of the economics of design. And because once you get a good design, you might not want to get rid of it just to hide it and how it works. But it seems like a lot of the, the, the things that are going on here are, are basically generalized. And they have all these great like, ways of dealing with you know, users. Users take coins. They have smart cards maybe that they buy, or they have a credit card. And administrators, well, they need to have some way to access the meter. And you know, there's a whole bunch of things, like a coin slot. Some coin slots actually have RF. So there's a short range RF device inside the coin slot. So like it looks like there's no smarts in the meter at all, but it turns out that there might be. Yeah, and there's, there, there's a lot of um, sort of administrator interfaces, and some of them are the same as the user, right? So the coin slot, like Jake just mentioned, has um, uh, um, but yeah, a short range, almost RFID-like sort of inductive coupling for uh, very short range data transfer um, in certain meters. Smart cards um, and credit cards. But the coin and smart card could also be used for administrator interfaces. Some of the parking meters we looked at could, uh, the flash uh, memory, the firmware could be reprogrammed through the smart card interface um, with, the, with the proper tools. Then you have things like infrared on certain parking meters, wireless capabilities in, in a lot of the newer ones um, that could serve as reprogramming or, or data gathering. Um, and then also some really interesting ones, like this picture here is from a, a meter made uh, that I caught um, in San Francisco one day. And uh, you can see she, she has this small, oh, you can't really see it. Um, she has this small PDA that's sitting on her cart. And there's a wire connecting to this uh, metal key that's shoved into the, the uh, slot of the coin box lock. Um, and I mean, who would have thought that you could actually have serial communication through a coin box lock? I, I definitely didn't. No. Um, so I was surprised to see that. And that's one of the interfaces that are used in this particular type of meter to suck down uh, audit information. Uh, and then possibly do other administrative, administrative functions. And an interesting thing about this is that you can see how they implemented some role separation here, is if you can open the meter, they assume you can take the money out, so that they put the serial bus on the outside to stop people from being able to take money. So they clearly weren't thinking about this from the perspective of exposing a bus. That might, I don't know, that doesn't seem like a good idea to me. So but you it, put those behind the locks, usually. So. But it's also a typical, um, a typical thing that you see in, in most embedded systems is some sort of programming interface, some sort of developer's backdoor, or something that, that a legitimate user can get access to. And if that's the case, which it is, if a legitimate user can get access to these ports, then uh, uh, a curious um, hacker, for example, could as well. Um, so we have a bunch of different pictures just to, to kind of get everybody excited about what's out there. Um, uh, Austin, Texas has a parking meter. There, now there's like three major single space parking meter manufacturers, um, and then there's a few others that, that do multi-space, but there's a finite number of these vendors. Um, and as you'll see in some of the pictures later, there's a lot of overlap in the design techniques that were used for all of these different competitors. And I think one of the reasons they did that is for modularity, because uh, in interchangeability, because that head might be replaced uh, by the city of Austin with uh, one of a different company, and, and things need to line up. So there's Austin, Texas has a smart card interface. Chicago is an interesting one. We'll talk about uh, this more in a few slides. This is a, a new multi-space meter. 
Vancouver, Vancouver. Is, is, a, is an interesting one. So I was told by the uh, fine Canadian people uh, while I was taking this photo that when you pay by phone, it doesn't actually change the value on the meter. You get like put into a special log, and when the meter maid goes to like check you to see if you're valid, then it's like it's okay. So there's actually multiple systems that you can game there potentially, and you might like it doesn't even matter that these systems are like perfectly secure in some way because they have another backend system that's driven by a telephone. And that's actually an interesting thing because the meter maid usually when they drive by on the street they see like the meter blinking that it's empty. So it could be empty. They can come up and now they have to scan the meter, or communicate with the meter, or communicate with the back end system to see if it's even exactly if there's been money in it. So it seems like additional labor. So I, I don't actually have a car in, in Vancouver, so I wasn't able to try it. So if anyone from Vancouver has more tips, send us uh, send us yeah. the info. We'd like to hear about it. Um, and then Jerusalem, which I, I just happened to be there and walk by and I couldn't uh, help but take a picture. Um, so. They're, they're, they're everywhere. Um, so some of the prior problems, prior failures, we're not the first people to look at, at parking meters. Um, and uh, we're definitely, uh, oh, parking meters, um, this parking meter that we looked at is definitely not the first one to fail. Um, New York City had a problem uh, with um, their parking meter back in 2001 that had the infrared capabilities for, for administrator access. And somebody figured out that you could take your universe remote control and set it to some key, some button, and it would uh, uh, just reset the meter back to zero, which is a great social attack. Do you want to mention that now since we're... Yeah, sure. So, so imagine you know where someone is parking, and you really don't like them. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, just like that. they put in three hours worth of time, and you, uh, you know, reset the meter and then call tow truck. Uh, it, Uh, well, not exactly. See, if they fill it up for three hours in a multi-space, and they have three hours of credit, and they walk away thinking they don't need to feed the meter for three hours, then you reset it to zero and call a tow truck, then they're, they're going to think they're safe. Well, you can't you can't add to it, but but you can't you can't reset it to zero. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I get it. Nice. Okay. Well, exactly. Wait. Okay, hey, so. were your meters manufactured by JJ McKay from Nova Scotia, by any chance? Well, that's even that's even better because now you don't need a universal remote control to reset. Yeah. It, right? So okay. I mean, that's even better. Some, I'm sure that some of these meters would even fall prey to like a taser. Right. Yeah, which we'll, so we'll if they're not electronically that. isolated, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. It's yeah, a good one. You so, laugh, but it's yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's <laughs> and we we, we want to give props also to Hikari because he did some really cool work, and it's in the Uninformed Journal. If you if you don't read Uninformed, you probably should. Uh, if you don't read Uninformed, you are uninformed. <laughs> yeah. That the the research that Hikari did with the San Diego meters, um, a very very different method that the smart card interface used. Um, but it's a great way to just see another attack and another design method that, that doesn't work. Um, and then Chicago, uh, just recently in June 2009, they deployed a whole new multi-space system. Is anybody from Chicago here? A few people. OK, have you seen these parking meters? Oh, yeah. That's what he says. You love them? Yeah. <laughs> so Chicago ha has um, historically been very uh, disappointed with the parking um, problem, I guess, in the rates that are being charged for parking in Chicago. Um, so when these multi-space meters came out, there was sort of this kind of social unrest uh, because the parking rates went up. Now you had these multi-space meters. Different areas of the, of the city had different rates, which is not, un not uncommon, but um, some, of the, some of the neighborhoods were very, very expensive. Um, so there was a problem as soon as these meters got deployed uh, where some of the meters just stopped working. And of course, the first thing the media does is go, oh my god, hackers have taken over the parking meters. Um, and then they called me. <laughs> and I, I didn't answer the email. Yeah. I didn't want any part of that. And um, being the media whore that I am, I called them back. And, uh, and, and, and in this case, I think that the problem, the problem was located to one particular area of Chicago, one neighborhood that had a different rate than all the other neighborhoods. And it was a rate that apparently was, I don't know if it was so high that they hadn't tested it, but they hadn't have tested, they hadn't have tested that rate. 
So there was a failure, and I, I had to tell the, uh, tell the media my opinion, which was, sorry, it's probably not people that are pissed off. It's probably a firmware problem. Um, and the company never responded to, to the media's request and everything, and then it sort of disappeared. So I don't know if any of you guys from Chicago know what had happened with that. The outcome, yeah. That guy was all over us. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so I don't know if they, they, maybe they fixed the problem, maybe they reduced the rate, but um, these meters, uh, these multi-space meters had wireless capabilities. Um, apparently they connected up through the cell phone network to phone home or something. So there's potentially all sorts of new attacks that we barely even discuss that could be done. So I don't know, I thought that was kind of fun. But there's a lot of, lot of existing work on parking meters. Um, and uh, I don't know, I, I think it's sort of exciting. Yeah. Yeah, so the general process that we're going to go through real quick is the uh, attack postulation. We, we sort of like start with lofty goals, and then we move down to the practical. Um, how we did information gathering, hardware analysis, firmware reverse engineering, smart card analysis, just the general process you would use if you were going to pull something like this off. So. And then we'll show the specific pieces of that process that we use for our, our case study um, in San Francisco. Right. So um, if we start here, the, imagine if you wanted to, you could key a meter to a particular person if you knew something about them. You could use the LCD as like a covert channel. Like, you know, you put in your smart card to park like you do every day and crow flies at midnight, yeah. right? <laughs> um, Jeff Moss suggested uh, meter to meter virus propagation, which, I mean, you know, Depends if there are bugs in the meters and they have strong enough RF radios. Whoops, owned. Yeah. Which, which another thing with taking advantage of RF there, as opposed to virus propagation, if they're if each meter is communicating with with another meter, you'd uh, potentially modify uh, whatever RF or take advantage of whatever um, wireless modules inside of the device, reprogram the firmware for that particular device, and maybe suck information out covertly. Um, especially if it's a credit card based meter and the meter is reading credit cards, and then you send those out via the RF channel, and then at the, uh, the attacker would sit there and monitor the credit card information. Yeah, in NoiseBridge, we do a little bit of magnetic stuff. And uh, one of the things that's possible to do is if you have a credit card reader, you don't have a secure bus between the credit card reader, generally speaking, and, and the uh, actual embedded computer. So you can just tap some wires and get some serial data straight out, and then you could send that out over like ZigBee or whatever with a static AES key. And, right. No work at all, really. If you had physical access, and, and I think um, Physical access is overrated a lot of times with these, with these meters, especially with probably some of you guys are, who are here. Yeah, so there's a bunch of denial of service attacks that so we mentioned a couple of them. Um, another one, though, is that if, if you figure it out a way to defraud a meter and the, the city is being vigilant and you figure out the way that their unique identifier system works, it's possible that you could use a card in some way and uh, get other people's cards to be blocked instead of yours. If yeah, you just figure out how to rotate them. Make maybe a serial number, flip a bit here, flip a bit there. And one, one example is, uh, which we'll talk about with, with the city of San Francisco, is there is a unique serial number associated with each card. Um, actually, I guess it's unique uh, because we can emulate all of that. So if I knew that, that Jake had, a, had his stored value card and he was using it with serial number 1245 and I wanted to you know, maybe induce some fraud alert if the city was looking for that, I would make a card also with 1245 and use it all over the place lots of times for more than $50, then you know, maybe he's going to get blocked and he won't be able to use his $50 card anymore. I ride a bicycle. Yeah, that's a good solution. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's actually one of our suggested fixes. Yep, yep. Uh, so, um, yeah, so the immediate deduction of credit, I, uh, I think, is a, is a good one. Because you, I mean, depending on the city in which you live, this can be like a really bad attack. Like San Francisco just loves to tow people, right? They have no idea how to generate income, so they just screw everybody with parking all the time. <laughs> And so if you can get someone to get a ticket and you can call in a tow truck, then that's going to cost that person potentially hundreds of dollars. And if they don't know that that's what happened and they think their car's been stolen, then maybe it costs them more. Maybe it gets shipped. And if they wait a really long time, like if they're going out of town, then maybe it gets sold at the dock, right? I mean, it's like, <laughs> oof, nasty. <laughs> Um, and it's also possible you can change the audit log. So the whole purpose of a lot of these electronic meters, as I said before, was to stop people from skimming. But if you don't actually have like cryptographic security, how can you ensure that those meter logs aren't tampered with? And that's, well, not, maybe you can't. So. And for those of you that have seen The Simpsons, you're probably better at the you know, every oh, day. Is. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Sorry. Free parking for everybody. <laughs> um, Only on Sunday. In theory, you, you can do theory. that, right? Uh, never say free subway rides for life. <laughs> That's Joe, right. right. We've learned that. I didn't okay. say for life. Right. Oh, right. Sorry. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so uh, another one that is, it's actually not very lofty, is that you could just have unlimited payment with smart cards, right? It turns out that uh, if you have an eCash solution and you haven't actually looked at the relevant literature for eCash, then you're probably doing it wrong. And that, that is, uh, of course, the case study that we're going to show is the, is the smart card interface. Um, and we'll get to that. Yeah. So information gathering is, is, is typically the first step. You know, once, once we knew that we wanted to look at, at parking meters and, and we knew that we wanted to look in San Francisco, these are, are sort of the steps that we went through. But actually, these are more general. Um, as far as things you can do, you might need to social engineer information, obviously use the internet um, to get information not only from search engines, but also from uh, various forums, um, specific uh, uh, vendors, read product information, data sheets, any information you can get. Dumpster diving if you need to. If you're um, local, it helps. Yeah, if you're local, it helps. And then obviously, uh, uh, also getting a hold of the target hardware. Um, and depending on your situation, you might do one of those things. Buy it, borrow it, talk to the vendor, and get something. So uh, any number of possibilities. So we'll get into the details of what we did in San Francisco once we go through these. Um, hardware analysis, uh, once, once you have the hardware in place, you can disassemble it, look for clues that might give you information uh, as far as if you wanted to tamper it uh, or tamper with the device without opening it. So you'd look for clues that uh, might lead to any sort of external interface attack. Um, you might learn about design techniques that are used with one manufacturer that you could possibly take advantage of with another manufacturer. Or if you get access to the circuit board, um, you might just do things as sim simple as retrieving the firmware from, from flash memory or retrieving the firmware from the microprocessor. Reverse engineering that, figure out how that all works. And there's a whole separate section on, on, uh, on firmware reverse engineering. Um, so what we did, and we're going to show a few pictures now, um, is, is we decided to pick up a few single space parking meters, basically whatever we could find on eBay within the few months of time that we had done this work. Um, and we, we bought three. The Duncan EMM 7700 uh, is the oldest, the Palm APM, and then the McKay Guardian. Uh, some of them were as cheap as 99 cents, and one of them was $500. Uh, but still well worth it. So this is the uh, Duncan meter here? Yeah, th this, this is the, the mechanical slash electrical hybrid um, that uh, has the, the, the mechanical lever, but still some electronics inside. Um, you can sort of see what was neat about this one is when you put the coins in, there's some mechanism that, depending on the size of the coin, uh, different buttons on the outside that, that are uh, little screws that you can barely see in the picture. Different, different buttons are pressed, and that sort of emulates the sequence to hit some buttons so the electronics uh, know what value to put on the meter. Um, some things circled here uh, is the infrared port. So even as early as 1991, uh, what is that, 18 years ago, um, there were infrared capabilities already available on meters. So it's not a new interface, um, which is surprising that it's, it's generally still unprotected. Um, you know, especially in the case of, of New York City 10 years later. Um, and then there's all sorts of buttons. There's some debug uh, test buttons on there that, that run, the, uh, run the electronics. There are all sorts of interesting um, uh, startup and, and uh, debug routines. It's definitely nice to be able to say, oh, boy, I wish I could reset the meter the way that they might reset the meter. Oh, there's a button. OK. <laughs> or another one is, boy, I wonder what it takes to like add credit. Well, it turns out those like five buttons down there, those are like setting money and time buttons. Yeah. So that's useful to know. OK, thanks. And then you, I mean, it, depending on how you want to get into that, I mean, there are some, you might be able to find similarities in commands. There's places you can dig around. So well, it's, it's a nice quick starting point just to see that that's how some meter manufacturers do it. Well, hardware hacking, too, it, just like any other type of reverse engineering, is all about gathering clues, right? So you know, we, we look at all these different things, gather clues. We might not realize how they all tie together or how we can use these different pieces of information together. But you do this research, you get as many clues as you can, and then you start uh, formulating your, your attack. Um, underneath the LCD is where the microprocessor was located. That's, a, um, in this case, a Mitsubishi M50932D, um, which had an internal eight, 8 kilobytes of internal ROM. Um, so if you want to pull out the firmware, you have to do, do it on this device. And then there's a close-up of the infrared. Um, the next one is the Palm APM. Uh, which this particular unit came from Israel, uh, but it was made by Palm in the US. So there's this cross-pollination of various countries manufacturing devices and selling them to other places. Um, 
I thought that was sort of neat. In the case, uh, I mean, uh, not specific to Israel, but just in general, when you have these uh, engineers in one country uh, that are designing a meter and then they're selling it to other countries, you have like interesting uh, economic issues that might crop up. Like, it's totally feasible that an engineer there could figure out a way to like have a back door in that system and then profit from it, and they could potentially never get caught because, well, they're in a completely different country. Yeah. So uh, you never know. Um, inside of the Palm APM, uh, the front side, there's nothing really exciting. Um, but there is this tiny little debug connector that I thought was sort of cool um, in the lower right. And then um, another debug connector on the, uh, the upper right of that picture. So once you get physical access to the unit, there's all sorts of things you can do. And, and I'm sure some of you guys are saying, yeah, if you get physical access, the system's broken anyway. But um, it's all about gathering clues. So we, you know, we got this one on eBay. We can sit in the lab. And if we wanted to target this meter, we would look at those external interfaces, try to get more information that would then give us uh, um, data that we could possibly use for an attack without requiring physical access. Um, from the front side, a lot of these meters are modular. Um, so if you see uh, the picture on the left, the main picture, there's a smart card interface um, and then the coin uh, detector. And those are modular devices that can be pulled out. Um, and the main reason for that is for easy repair if somebody destroys um, the smart card interface or shoves you know, a bunch of slugs inside of the, uh, inside of the coin, coin slot. They could just be removed, a new one slapped in, and no problem. But those interfaces also could be monitored if you did want to try to figure out what was specifically going on. Um, and then there's access to the ROM there as well. WPROM and Atmel 29LV256, easily accessible, easily removable, um, supported in just about any, every device programmer um, out there if you did want to pull off the memory. Uh, then the other side, more test buttons, um, microprocessor, a Motorola device. So there's you know, similarities of easy access to flash memory, test interfaces. Uh, the modularity, I, I think, is neat. I think this one's probably my favorite. Yeah. I, I have a deep love for Canada. And uh, <laughs> those of you that know me, I've lived there several times in my life. And McKay is a, a great Canadian company. Uh, and so, I mean, just looking at this warms my heart. Um, so in any case, uh, you can see here uh, just the outside of this particular Guardian meter. And you can see the EEPROM, um, which is an Atmel AT, uh, 28C256, yes. I guess. Yes. So uh, it's got a microprocessor, which is a Z80. Um, basically, it has a custom ASIC attached to it. Um, and this is the same one that's used on the newer XLE meters. So yeah, so, so this meter, the McKay Guardian, is the precursor to the Guardian XLE that's used in San Francisco. So, and we knew that. So this was the one that we could physically acquire and open up. So we decided to do that. This is an example of how uh, even if San Francisco did everything properly, and they never, ever had any problems whatsoever with their meter infrastructure, the fact that McKay is this company who is, is, is going to build these meters, they're going to have a previous revision, and you can look at this. And if we find a problem with this one, it almost certainly will apply to that one. And this one also is, you know, it's beautiful. It's modular. I don't know if you can say beautiful with these, but it's electronics are beautiful. Yeah, they're beautiful. So it's got an EEPROM there. It's another Atmel, and it's got uh, that, which what two picks on it? Yeah, that was Atmel. Yeah, yeah. So that's a close-up of the Atmel, and then the CLT blah blah blah, which yeah. is the which is the ASIC. So this is an interesting thing in the upper right-hand corner of the slide. Um, you'll see that that's the uh, coin shoot, and then below that is actually the smart card interface. And the way that these things are designed, like specifically McKay has uh, literature that they've put out online. It's like that's the sacrificial part how they refer to the smart card interface, because they just feel like you know, if a part of the meter is going to go, they're going to go by vandal. That's how it's going to go. They're going to be attacked by you know, some unruly teenagers with tinfoil. Yeah. Right? That's like the kind of like threat modeling that they're or doing. Or super glue. Right? Yeah, and that's, as, as we get through these, a lot of the um, thought that went into protecting these meters by re you know, reading through all the data sheets is specifically vandalism. Very little to do with actually security-related attacks. Yeah. This, they trusted the meter stuck in place on the street. So. Right. So you can see here that uh, uh, in this photograph, there's the infrared port also, and there's a reset and debug mode buttons, which are, again, very useful for seeing what's going on, seeing what's happening you know, just at any given point when you want to, like, say, you want to reverse a, a particular bus. And this is the first time I'd ever looked at this you know, using uh, some of Joe's equipment. You know, we, we figured out that you know, there are some buses that are exposed via that RJ45 cable. There's buses exposed elsewhere. Just being able to like, reset it and put it into a debug mode at all 
meant that we could spend just tons of time figuring out how they communicate. And all we have to do is find the way that they do the signaling to know that we're going to be able to interpret the rest of their data, which is super useful for the next steps that we had to go through with the McKay. And, and we threw in just one more picture. This is, this is a picture of part of my lab. And um, when we had taken apart the McKay Guardian, and we, we d determined by, by kind of probing out um, from various places on the board that that, that uh, debug connector did have um, what we thought were some communication interfaces. There was an I2C bus, which is a standard internship communication. Um, there was a serial, uh, asynchronous serial bus. Um, and what we'd also found out is that upon power up, which is why it, the power up, the uh, reset button was so useful, or upon power up, upon reset, um, the system would spit out a bunch of stuff on the infrared port, and it would also spit out the same data um, on the, uh, on the, um, the physical uh, uh, connector. So we could use the oscilloscope, which you see in the background, to try to capture that data, try to figure out exactly what protocol was being used for the infrared, um, which might give us clues about the other interfaces, specifically the ones that we could access on a San Francisco XLE, being the smart card interface primarily. Um, possibly the same serial communications were being used on some unused pin that was the administrator uh, port. So we played around with that for a while. Um, we didn't actually get too far, uh, but it turns out for, for our purposes, uh, it's not necessary, and you'll see why. Um, so again, uh, the next step, if you need to take this step, um, which we didn't in our case for, for this particular attack, um, extracting program code uh, um, onboard, you know, from onboard memory, flash and ROM. Um, what I normally do is I'll grab the code and before even trying to do anything um, technical, I'll run strings on it, see if we can get any, any information about, you know, are, are, there, are there constants in there that might give you some clue about what's going on, and then you try to disassemble it, reverse engineer it using your favorite tools. And um, this is something that, that Chris does a lot of, so I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, I was just very secure that you know, nothing's encrypted, everything's in the clear. So if you get a hold of one of these meters, you can have a ball with it, as Joe and Jacob and I did. Um, and then smart card analysis. So th this is um, sort of the crux of what we're looking at for San Francisco. And it's also possible um, to look at a smart card system for other parking meters. But these three things are typical for any smart card you want to look at ever. Um, monitoring communications between the smart card and the target piece of hardware. Trying to decode that communication. Emulating it, possibly. Um, and then uh, performing some silicon dye analysis on the smart card. So there's a lot of things that can be done, and, and we actually went through um, these steps uh, for the San Francisco case study. Yeah, so as you can see here, uh, this is one of San Francisco's fine parking meters with uh, one of their cards that you can buy. And the idea is that uh, it's really terrible to have to carry around you know, a roll of quarters. And uh, essentially, they wanted to solve that because they also want to be able to jack up the rates and do other things. And they want to make it convenient for people to uh, basically pay. And so they have these smart cards, and they just slide right in there, and they act exactly like a quarter. Put it in, you wait, and it's like you've reached into your pocket. It takes that long. And, um, then also you can see um, on the right there, there's the Rhino meters, and that's an Australian meter company. And they also take uh, smart cards as well. So they're compatible, um, even though uh, they're not made by the same company. They've been made to basically interface with the same smart card. So they've basically created this like interchangeable eCash solution with these smart cards, which is kind of interesting. And there's two other meters. Um, the one on the left is a, an older style with no smart card interface. Uh, made by a different company. I don't, I, I don't exactly remember which one it was. Um, and then the one on the right is a, a, a newer, another new type of meter, which is a credit card based system. Um, and there's text on there that you probably can't see, but it says SFMTA parking card not accepted. Um, and so these purely read credit card information. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed with San Francisco, and, and um, we've read a, a number of news articles about the city, is they're sort of grasping at straws as far as what parking infrastructure they want to implement. So there's all of these different types that are set up in different parts of the neighborhood, um, but they haven't exactly figured out what they want to do. But it's, it's actually kind of atrocious, I think. Um, they have a $35 million pilot program to replace their mechanical meters, and they're considering trying to add over 300,000 more parking meters to all of the residential areas of San Francisco. Yeah. So if you have a car, mm -hmm. Any, yeah, park, any, any parking, right. any the, space that's you know, as wide as this table, they're going to stick a meter in front of. And, and the, um, they think it's better for the environment also, because people right. will move their cars and people will have less congestion. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seriously. Yeah. That's so, not a joke. In, in 2003 is when this initial pilot program happened where the mechanical meters were replaced with the, the picture we showed you first, the, the McKay Guardian XLE, uh, which had the smart card interface. That was supposed to just be a pilot program. $35 million is a lot for that, but that was also six years ago. And I don't know if that pilot program is going on or if they just sort of forgot about it and said, oh, the system sort of works, it's okay. But to me, a pilot is sort of supposed to be an evaluation, um, but that's a really long evaluation. Or a really badly done evaluation. Yeah. That might be the other thing. Right. Um, so. Well, the, the, Possibly, the, yeah. The, the, city, the city of Berkeley had a funny encounter some number of years ago. I guess someone really didn't like parking meters there, so they did a little direct action. And uh, they got a saw, and they cut off the heads of all of the parking meters in, in the area that they were um, upset about. You know, most likely, though, these meters are going to get upgraded in the future, too. Yeah. McKay's going to come in and do a firmware download, just like Kinko's did on the Kinko's attack. Right. And, okay. and this, everything we're talking about is going to be null well, and void. Yeah. I mean, undoubtedly, the systems will be replaced, but the problem is that the... the, the, the yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the attack that we found has existed since the meters came into San Francisco, and it probably existed in, in some similarity in other cities. So, um, you know, our tax dollars are at work, and, and as a, a, a new permanent San Francisco resident, um, I want my money going to places, you know, to things that actually help the city and not just yeah. go I towards parking solutions. I, I find it a little offensive that they would spend $35 million on uh, basically adding these parking meter solutions. And, and trying to continue to find ways to essentially tax people, like a backdoor tax, when we still have like hundreds of homeless people roaming the streets, right. and it's not even safe to go in parts of the city. Right. Seems like a kind of weird way of going about a bootstrapping profit, you know? It's so not a little, cost. Yeah, a little bit broken. Um, and so the way that, that the particular smart card system works, in this case, it's a stored value card. You go to uh, particular uh, places in San Francisco and, and pot, buy in cash, uh, 20 or $50 valued cards. They are not rechargeable. You buy them for 20 or $50, you put it in the meter, you spend $20 worth of meter time, and you throw the card away. Um, online, you can purchase them uh, with credit cards, which potentially is a scary privacy issue if, if San Francisco is keeping track of the, uh, of the serial numbers and correlating that with the purchaser. Um, so the, the end result, what's the whole thing we've been talking about? This is pretty much it. It's easy to replay any transaction um, through the smart card interface to uh, obtain unlimited parking um, and, uh, and a few other things which you'll see. But basically a very simple replay attack. You can modify data and, and increase your value. You can do a few other things. And all of this work was done without a physical meter um, in our possession in three days of sort of obsessed just looking at, at the data um, and using a digital oscilloscope to capture the transaction. So nothing special. Um, yes, I have experience doing hardware, but yes, there's thousands of other people that could potentially do this. So it's a very, very simple attack, um, and that shouldn't happen in this day and age, especially if a city is paying $35 million and relying on this smart card system. So it almost seems like it, it wasn't analyzed at all, and if it was analyzed, it wasn't analyzed properly. As a taxpayer, I find it kind of like a, a funny thought. They spent $35 million on deploying all of this, like with the dollar signs of profit in their eyes, and didn't think to hire someone like Joe or Chris for like, you know, one week of their time. Because that's twice as much time as is necessary to break their crappy system. Actually, I don't do consulting, let the record show, so yeah. we're not doing this research in order to get work. Right, which that's the other thing, is it? They'd have to find someone like them, but yes. they wouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. So only for free. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> only for the good of the people. Correct. So um, San Francisco is kind of funny. Um, you know, it's a friendly town. So um, yeah. So I think that it's it's probably worth uh, mentioning that if you if you just want to talk to someone, I mean, Minix here in the front, he could probably speak volumes about this, um, but. Wow, I just happened to run into this Department of Parking and Transportation guy, and uh, <laughs> a long, long time ago, Moxie and I were working on some smart card stuff, and I thought, you know, the city of San Francisco has smart cards. You know, I think I'm gonna look into that. And I ran into this fellow, I was wearing a 2600 t-shirt, backpack, walking down by the Embarcadero, and there's a guy opening up a multi-space meter, and I said, hey, um, you know, I've always wanted to work with computers, what's your job like? <laughs> and, and he said, uh, <laughs> well, um, you know, I really like it a lot. I was like, oh, so you work for the city? He's like, yeah. It's like, do people treat you badly? I mean, it seems like you have a hard job. It's like, no, no, people like me. I don't write the tickets. 
I just work on these machines. I was like, cool, is that like a Windows computer on the internet? And, and he's like, you know, no, it's not, a, it's not a Windows computer on the internet. No, they, I was like, well, but like, can I use my cell phone? I, I bought, I finally got a cell phone. I, <laughs> I haven't had like electronic devices really around me, but I thought that I should get one because my, you know, my girlfriend, she, she wanted to be able to reach me. And we, you know, we talked for a while, and he said, you know, I should come down to the city and apply for a job, and like, I'm really eager and interested in learning, and you know, there's a, you know, great ladder to climb. And, and I said, well, you know, thanks very much. Can you just tell me, like, so if I can't use my phone to pay for it, does that mean that, like, these meters aren't like a, like some kind of, what do they call that, a mesh network where they, like, to all talk to each other? Like, some sort of intelligent, what do they call that? Uh, and, and, you know, he's like, no, 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 they're all, they're all disconnected from each other. I was like, oh, crazy. So how do I pay with this? And he's like, well, you get one of these cards, right? See, and you just put it in the meter like this. And he shows me how the meter works, and, uh, you know, thank him very much. And I, like, you know, hunch my backpack up and walk away and hope he doesn't read the shirt. And, uh, or doesn't know what it is. Yeah, exactly. And, and as, it, as it turns out, like, that was enough information in that conversation extracted to know exactly how to attack the system. And it was, it was perfect. It worked out great. And then, of course, you just need to look on the internet after that. Start to look at smart cards. Start to think about the protocols you need to, to actually look at. Um, maybe you can find design docs or specifications, or you can find press releases where they're talking about how good their systems are, and they talk about what those systems are. And often they include, it's secure. And they don't detail that at all, which is great. Because then they also say stuff like industry standard X or industry standard Y. When you look at it, it has no security consideration at all. It's like no conception of security. Never trust press releases. Oh, oh, oh they're so great, though. <laughs> so great. Always inflated. And of course, the question is like, well, you know, this company, there's this one company. Maybe they have some engineers. Do you think that maybe those engineers have ever had technical trouble? What do you guys think? Yeah. Maybe? Yeah? Okay. Everybody has trouble. Everybody's human. So, well, it turns out they do. Uh, and, like, specifically, J.J. McKay had an engineer who didn't know how to use CVS. He says, I am learning how to use CVS, and as part of this process, I set up a test repository to play with. <laughs> and uh, he's not very familiar with playing, I guess. Uh, and you can see in here some information. For example, you see that he's working on the ePERS system. Well, you can tie that information to the press release about the San Francisco ePERS system. So you know that, that probably they're using CVS and ePERS. And you go down a little further, and you can see you know, he's using Sigwin here on you know, uh, the Windows 95 NT configuration there. So OK, it's a little old. Yeah, you but the, the, most, the most important thing, at least, well, one of the most important things was uh, if you look down, you see gemplus underscore lib underscore path. That gave us the clue right away. Oh, they're using uh, gemplus smart cards. Right. So we didn't, have to do, we didn't have to look at a smart card at all to know that they're using Gemplus. So now we can go target Gemplus, do research about their smart cards, see how their implementation works, et cetera. And, and of course, if you're, uh, anybody here use Ida Pro at all? Or maybe you just disassemble binaries by hand or something? I don't know. Anyway, uh, hey, Obsjump and grep works fine. So um, they're using GCC, right, in this example. So that, that is a very interesting fact, right? Because now you can start to think about the structure and interpretation of their computer programs, to rip off the title of that book. And um, there's a, the full text of that email is at that URL on the bottom of the slides. I highly recommend reading it. It is epically funny. So, and we crossed out the guy's name because it's not his fault. Yeah, it's not his fault at all. Um, and it was eight years ago, and CVS was still new in 1908. But the point is that so, you, do your, you do your information gathering, you find interesting things, and that was, that was one that, that gave us a little snicker. Um, so going into silicon dye analysis, what we did um, it is we bought a bunch of these smart cards at the store in cash. And it was funny because the, um, I, I typically go to one hardware store uh, to, to buy these cards every once in a while, because I love the system. I use it all the time. Um, but when we decided to buy 10 smart cards, um, I just, I, I didn't really want to go to the place that I buy them at all the time. So I went to a different place. And I walk in, and I had $200 in cash with me. And I walk in, and I'm like, yeah, you guys sell smart cards here? And the guy's like, yeah, you know, what value? Uh, I said 20, and he pulls out one. I'm like, oh, no, actually, I need 10. And he's like, 10? In a row. Yeah. He's like, 10. What do you do? I'm like, oh, I'm a salesman, and I drive around. You know, I use the parking meters a lot. He's like, oh, 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 OK. And you know, so he gives me 10. And um, I thought of that when I was walking in. I was like, yeah. So, 
I, I, Not as good a social engineering attack as Kevin Mitnick could do, but I'm learning. <laughs> so a, kind of, uh, a kind of awesome thing is also, I mean, when you're looking at a system, it's great to know what you might want to look for. So you might know something about the protocol, but maybe you're, you're interested in having, um, say, a serial number, and you want to find the serial number in a data stream. What happens when the serial number is written on the outside of the card? Right. That's easy to correlate. Super helpful. So, uh, and what happens when they're sequential? Also, that is also super helpful. Thank you very much. Yeah, so it happened that all 10 we bought were, were sequential, so we could do all sorts of interesting inf information analysis on that, which we did later. Um, so what we did, too, is sent the cards over to Chris, who's down here, and um, <laughs> want, wanted to try to decapsulate the smart cards, look at the actual dies themselves, and get clues. And then Chris is going to talk about that. Now? This little process. Now or later. <laughs> yeah, do it now. OK, yeah, so basically we tore these two smart cards apart. We had. Uh, we had an me asynchronous memory chip with, a, with an ASIC inside, which uh, they called a melody card from S.T. Thompson. Uh, 1.2 uh, micron process, 1,200 nanometers, very old technology. <clears throat> and uh, can they see that slide? Can you see these? Yeah, the slide on the right. And then they had uh, a smart card from a company called SST, Emosim, S.A. Marin, if you've ever heard of these guys. And this is basically um, off-the-shelf smart card chip with no type of crypto engine, nothing. So whatever they implement in, inside is in software only. And um, Personally, I wanted to attack the smart card chip, but we didn't need to get that far because these guys had a better breakthrough. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't really know what else to comment on. Uh, yeah, I mean, what, what, we, what we learned from this, though, is that... We showed the, the hardware porn. I think that's really... Yeah, we'll show you the, we'll show you the hardware porn. Um, but basically, <laughs> what Chris figured out is that there's two different types of chip. And they, they look different, and they look cool. And yeah, Chris, Chris looked at them um, in much, much more detail and figured out one was this, this hardware-based uh, ASIC single functionality thing. And then one was a universal microprocessor that happened to run code that emulated that fixed system. Which hey, is, that's uh, a great $20. idea. Yeah, the $20 cards, I believe, are the ones with the... Uh, well, no, no, I think it was not, on, not based on value, but based on serial numbers. That's right, that's right. So the, the, yeah. older, the older cards were the, were the ASIC-based ROM unchangeable thing, and the newer cards had a microprocessor. And so, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, so the... Um, the interesting thing about the microprocessor is that because it can run custom code, maybe, it's, maybe it is running or it can run things that are not the same as the initial card. Maybe there is hidden commands, maybe there's undocumented commands that the card could potentially send to the meter if triggered in some way. And in that case, one could retrieve the code from the smart card using some of Chris's very, very well-known techniques and then reverse engineer the firmware to see, is it simply just emulating a standard older version of the card, or is it possibly doing something newer that we can learn from? And potentially, uh, if you were to find an interface for reprogramming it, um, you might be able to take their exact card, which will look physically the same to someone that's inspecting it, say like if a police officer was like upset or saw that in your wallet, it doesn't look like something a hacker would have. It looks like what most of San Francisco carries in their wallet. And then potentially you could even take their code and change it, which we didn't do that because it turns out that there's a much more elegant thing to do. And, and these cards are being bought by Gem Plus, Gem Alto, whatever they call themselves today. And so these cards aren't even made by McKay. McKay buys them and is an end user as well. Right. So it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, so I, I'm sorry. We skipped something that I think is very important um, about our research here. What we're showing in this particular um, uh, presentation, the case study in San Francisco, Parking meters, even if other cities use a McKay Guardian parking meter, the implementation is different per city. So we're showing something that's specific to San Francisco. There might be similarities to other systems, but this is a, a localized attack. Um, uh, and so it's really city-specific city implementation. Um, we are going to release some code based on, on uh, some of the work that we did, and, and we'll, show you, we'll, we'll explain all that in a second. Um, but we felt that because the research is just limited to the city of San Francisco. There's no point in releasing every single byte value that's going to enable somebody to go get free parking. Um, because the goal, as I mentioned, is to show the process and show the poor design practices. So the code is, it, it is going to be released on my site. Actually, it should be up already. Um, and it's more of a template of a smart card emulator. So you can see the function calls, but all the data has been changed to F. Um, but you'll be able to see how, how, how uh, how you could emulate a smart card if you wanted to. I mean, so um, we, of course, with the caveat of saying that this is implementation specific to San Francisco, 
you know, we don't uh, just, you know, roll out with a battery-powered scope to every city around town and, like, check it out. So if you want to check yeah. this out for your town, it could be that in Los Angeles or in Vancouver or wherever they happen to have one of these systems built by McKay, that they might have some code reuse and protocol reuse. So you can answer that and tell the world. Or built by other manufacturers because there is that uh, interoperability thing. So yep. it doesn't necessarily have to be McKay. Um, okay, so smart cards, just a, a very brief introduction um, of, of smart cards and ISO 7816. I'm not going to go into very much detail of this because you can learn about the, the, the protocol and the specifications um, on your own. But the smart card that we were looking at, uh, the Gem Plus, is an ISO 7816 compliant card, which means all of the electrical properties, the transmission protocols, everything is well documented. Um, so that's all, all I'm going to say about that. And except. Um, yeah, everything, even, you know, as far as the physical location of the pins. And in our case, um, only a few of the pins of the smart card are actually being used. So there is potential that the unused pins um, are being used for a, a, an external interface of some sort. On the, um, on the SST chip, they were all bonded out. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, 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 so all extra the IOs and things. So on the microprocessor, <laughs> the pins that are typically unused in an ISO 78, 7816 system were bonded out to the microprocessor, so they are definitely used for something. It might get into bootloader mode or something. There's a, yeah. there's a bootloader in that, in that uh, flash. It's fine. Yeah, so that's, there, there's a lot of stuff that we haven't looked at, as you can see. Um, transmission protocols, just about ISO 7816, there's, there's a few, um, but either asynchronous um, or synchronous data, and, um, and, and our, ours is going to end up being asynchronous data, which is just a standard uh, ser um, uh, serial port communication, just sort of like RS-232. We have you know a swing of negative 12 to 12 or um, zero to five, but it, it, no external clock is needed. It's asynchronous, and that's that's what we're that's what that's what we encounter. Um, so the first step in the process uh, is to monitor the communication between the smart card and the parker meter. Um, and to do that, we didn't need a physical meter at our house in our lab. We could go to any parking meter we wanted to on the street with um, an oscilloscope, capture that information then go back to the lab and decode that information. Um, and being in San Francisco, nobody cares what you do uh, pretty much ever. All you have to say, <laughs> hey, hey now, those are fighting words from local, you know. Um, you just have to say that it is for an art project. Yeah. No, matter what, <laughs> no matter what you are doing, you can get away with it as long as you say that it is in the name of art. <laughs> No joke, no matter what it is. Actually, this whole thing is an art project. It is. In fact, this is our art project. Yeah. It's a collaborative art project. So who here has ever sniffed, to say, anything? Like a, a bus or Ethernet? OK, right? So I mean, who, I mean, like, if you look at a smart card, like, I mean, for a long time, there, I think, was a, a long-standing myth. It's like, oh, well, you know, that's secure. Like, that's a pretty secure system. And I mean, Kinko's really blew that wide open. When they got owned, I mean, that was, like, seriously bad news. So I mean, obviously, that wasn't the case. But sniffing, sniffing that stuff, I mean, it depends on the implementation. If they suck the card into a device, it's a lot harder to sniff. But it turns out the parking meters, they're designed to you know, not have a lot of moving parts, because they don't want to be tampered with. But you just get a shim like that, and you're. Let me add to this. Um, but they didn't learn from the European um, telephone system with the prepaid cards, where they actually implemented uh, metal detectors in the slots, so that they knew that it was a contactless smart card without wires coming down a PCB. So they, they should have learned these types of things. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because so with the shim that we use, which essentially plug the smart card into a socket, then there's a long circuit board, and then the other side is a smart card, smart card contacts. But there's wires coming Thanks. off, so the European phone system or phone uh, phones can detect that, which is sort of cool. Um, and so we had this interface. You can see in the upper upper picture, there's a few leads coming off right below the socket. Those wires went to um, went to my oscilloscope. And after some probing around to try to figure out and verify that the pins defined in ISO 7816, the clock was the clock and the data was the data, to see if they're actually conforming to that, which they were, um, using some of the serial decoding uh, capabilities of my digital scope, which many oscilloscopes have, um, I could mess around with the configuration settings of asynchronous serial data and see that it was 9600 AE1. So this is, this is beautiful, the next slide here. Um, I have not ever worked with a scope that was as good as this one. No, um, I don't know what you asked. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just beautiful, you know, because you, you see this like burst of data and you think, ah, uh, well, how do we decode that? Well, you could like stick it into a sound card or something. I'm thinking about it from like the side of someone who does some software stuff. And then he's like, no, 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 hold on a second. You could like zoom in on the burst 
And you could say, I'd like to see what that would be if that was 8 bits with even parity. And then it displays in real time, and then you see the answer to reset, and you know that you've got what you wanted. Yeah, so the, the, thing, with, right? the thing with smart cards is when they're, when they're brought out of reset by whatever it's plugged into, it will send an answer to reset, an ATR, a four byte string always, um, or at least if it, uh, if it follows the ISO 7816 standard. So the answer to reset, there was four bytes being sent. And with the, with the digital decoding properties of an oscilloscope, if I had set to 8 bits with no parity, I would see a parity error. The, the bytes down there would not be gray. They, one of them would be red, or two of them would be red. So I could just set, you know, fiddle around with the settings until we got something that was correct. That answer to reset turns out that that is the ATR that's common for the Gem Plus um, club memo card. So once we knew that that was the correct communications protocol, now we can monitor the entire rest of the transaction. Oh yeah. Okay. So we're going to go really fast, and okay. then we'll show you the money shot. So differential analysis is really the key here. You capture a lot of data, and you log this stuff, and you look at it, and uh, really, quite seriously, a pen and paper. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to break this. You need yeah. 25 cents, or you need to come here and borrow one of these. <laughs> right. It, it, yeah. It was just a pen and paper, writing down once we de once we capture all the data, writing down the, how the transaction worked. What byte did the meter send the car? What did the card respond with? Back and forth, back and forth, and look at that. Um, this was also the first time that I looked at smart cards. So this was sort of the, you know, the most basic way to analyze a system. Um, and that's what I did. So we did multiple transactions with the multiple cards, um, different values, different serial numbers, just to gather a lot of information, and then we analyzed it. I'm sure Chris is thinking, you know, 1992 called. Yeah, right. We want, our, we want our text files. Yeah, I am actually yeah. thinking that. that yes. was, uh, I, I thought yeah. so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. So, I mean, it's, the, the protocol is, is really this simple, right? It, the meter talks to the card, the card responds. The meter responds, the card responds, and so forth. And if you remember, we talked about how the serial number was sequential. We knew what it was. Well, there it is again. We see it in the data stream. We also see the answer to reset. We see some other things. Constant. We see an unknown 8 and that's kind of an interesting thing, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And then the next slide. Yeah, so we can actually, with, with this unknown value, we don't know what it was, but we knew the card was sending eight bytes of something to the meter. Um, and then what sort of gets more interesting, this is all the initialization stage, by the way. When you insert the card, it goes through this three slides of initialization stuff every time. And then the value of the card is displayed on the meter before it even goes through the, the balance deduction um, or the unit deduction. Um, so at this point, more, there's more data going back and forth. There's some counter that's red. The meter actually responds with four bytes, which we think is calculated from these eight from the card. That's, that's some sort of password. And the card said, yes, that's the right password. You're allowed to do stuff to me. Um, so wait, wait a minute. Are you saying that, wait, what kind of authentication is that? Is that, that's not mutual. What is that? It's not mutual authentication. Oh, right. Yeah. None. Yeah, that's right. So, <laughs> well, got that. and as you'll see, we sure. could, yeah, we, we could always just respond with okay um, with our with our stuff. So there's the really long there's the really long attack, which is like, okay, well maybe they did do some sort of like cryptography there. Well, um, what happens when we just you know say okay to that password? Right. Oh, you know, it's okay. Right. So then, as far as, as far as the end of the initialization process, where the meter wants to try to determine what the remaining value is on the card. Um, it sends a command saying read balance two, and balance two is the location that I, I call balance two is the location inside the smart card where this value is stored. And depending on the value of card you buy, either $20 or $50 card, this value in balance two is always the same. So it, it's fixed, it doesn't change. Um, so zero AF, there's a bunch of F bytes, but zero AF is $20, 127 is 50, and we'll show you how that's actually calculated later. Um, and then it just it reads this transaction counter. Then a few seconds later, you go into deducting, deducting a unit of, of uh, value, but you'll see here there's not much to this. All the meter says is update balance one, and the card says okay. Um, and all that's doing is, is incrementing this, the CTC one, the transaction counter inside the card. So the card keeps track of how many times the meter has successfully communicated this or updated the balance of nothing. Um, so the CTC one is the only value that changes on the card that we've noticed ever. Anybody seen any problems with this so far? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and here's how the, the card value is computed. The balance two, which is fixed, depending on the card value, the, not, minus 95 decimal um, is the number of units. And then you multiply that by 25 cents, which is the unit in San Francisco, and there's your dollar value. So you can think what happens if you change zero AF <laughs> to something else, and we'll show you. Um, so once we were able to figure out how the protocol worked, um, the first attempt was just to do a simple replay attack. 
replay the entire transaction without changing a thing. Um, so I used a microchip pick device with some existing hardware that I um, use in my hardware hacking training course that I give at Black Hat. Um, it's, a, it's adorable. He has a big G logo, you know? <laughs> and, you know. It, it was the only device I had that had a microchip pick, and I wanted to write this in C using tools I was familiar with. Um, and it just happens, as you'll see later, that the microchip pick device was used by satellite TV hackers for you know, the past 10 years. So I picked the right device that actually I could buy all sorts of tools later on that would help me. Um, but the challenge was to do this in C and still be able to stay with the smart card protocol of having, um, you know, there's a very fast timing. Yeah, so get, get your camera out take a picture of that. Yeah, right? there's a code snippet that you can barely see, but that's, you know, the whole thing is available on the website with everything changed to F. Um, but essentially with the emulation, I, I just emulated the uh, initialization and then I emulated the card deduction. It was very simple, not, not very exciting. But the exciting part is here. Now that I knew how the remaining value was computed and I knew that I could communicate with the meter just like a card would with my own custom hardware, let's change balance two to respond with something else. So if you responded with FFF, then you'd have 4,000 units. Wow, that's a lot of units. Um, so we figured we would try that. And uh, oh yeah, what we could also do, since we control the response, is we could just have something that the uh, transaction counter never increments. So the card would always be at the maximum value. Um, and then, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, so once the hardware worked, decided when I did some, some more research and Google searching, it's like, oh yeah, PIX, cool. Satellite TV hackers have used this. It turns out that they make these things called a silver card, which is an exact microchip PIC with some external memory on a smart card. So I programmed my code onto that, and now I had a smart card that looked exactly uh, well, except the guy's face on it. So, like, like, like the one that's using the meter. So it's like progressive levels of sketchiness, right? Or, or I like the term, you know the term threshold, right? So sketch hold. The sketch hold here, is, it, it's extremely sketchy on the left, and as you move further to the right, all you need is a sticker. I think it's elegance. Yeah, yeah. well, it's work. also elegant. But, but if they had implemented, like, the uh, metal detector, into the, like they did yeah. in Europe, uh, this, we would have never got to where we got. That's right. We wouldn't have been able to sniff the initial transaction if there were security features in place of that smart card interface. Um, so, yeah, those are the initial steps, and... Um, Money shot? Yeah, so here's the result when you put the card <laughs> in the meter. I think this is where we're supposed to say that we uh, immediately removed the card after the balance was shown. Yeah, this was just showing the balance, not deducting value. Yeah. Anyway. We're pretty sure that, we're pretty sure that works, though. Yeah. But we never tried. <laughs> Uh, actually, we're completely sure it works because of the initial replay. Clues, clues, too many clues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not with this card. So we have, uh, we have some fixes. Um, not all of them are great. Um, pretty much San Francisco has a hard problem ahead of itself. And pretty much anybody that has isolated meter systems, um, I think they're in some trouble. They could try to do a daily audit. So they could say, collect all the audit logs every single day. And the reason they would need to do it daily is that they need to build a threshold where they say, like, if you know, we have someone that's figured out how to break the system or clone a system, we need to detect it as soon as possible. So if you say that period is 24 hours, that's expensive to collect. But it might be cheaper than the amount of fraud that can be committed in that time frame. But that's really hard. So having an offline system here is really working against them. Uh, and also, the correlation of the serial number and logs has some pretty big privacy implications, which I think people should consider. I mean, you can literally, if you, if you buy with a credit card, you can have this smart card, which now will show all the places you've parked. And they can plot where you've driven and parked the car. You might even be able to time the distance, you know? And there's see a bunch of other speeding. stuff. Yeah, so they could see if you're speeding, for example. Um, also, they really need to reduce the um, number of access methods that they have, because these meters have ridiculous numbers of access methods, right? We, we talked about the serial bus on the outside of the meter for uh, auto log information. That's just crazy. I mean, a serial bus on the outside, how electrically isolated do you suppose that is? Or at least a crypto Well, there's, there's serial, or there's the, the smart card, which is serial, the infrared, the... Um, the coin slot interface. So there's all sorts of different interfaces that are actually required in the specification for, for the Spark meter. And every interface could serve as an attack vector of some sort. We just happen to look at the smart card one. Um, this is, this, incorporating anti-tamper mechanisms um, goes along with what we were saying about the physical security is all that was preventing um, any sort of electrical attacks, physical attacks on the meter. Even some, something as simple as detecting the metal traces of a shim card going in would have prevented our, our very simple attack. Although, actually, it wouldn't have, because <clears throat> we could have taken a pick, 
talks to the gem memo club card, and then Joe here could have wrote a program that would have stuck his, his silver card in and recorded whatever it's sent in. Onto the external yeah. WP prom, that's, yeah, that's So he's that. going back and forth to a meter, and eventually he'd get it. That's true, okay. Yeah, good yeah. point. Yeah, so, yeah. Fail. it's a little more complicated. I think if you're going to spend $35 million on a system like this or more, yeah. it's probably worth abandoning the use of an offline system and actually making it useful. Imagine if you could actually pay for your parking online if you wanted to, yeah. uh, and maybe you could even use some of David Chom's like, you know, uh, double-blinded anonymous eCash system so that it's just like dropping in a quarter but far more convenient. Um, you could also see where there are parking uh, uh, spaces that are available. So you want to go see a movie, you know that you're going to park in the $10 garage. You can think about that before you leave. Because otherwise spending $35 million on this actually just opens themselves up to like tons of attacks where they're now in the money print printing business. And on top of it, they get to float your cash during that time frame, which is like a, an interesting sort of side benefit. So. Yeah, and, and of course, you know, if they add other capabilities to the system, then that opens up a whole new can of worms for, for other things. So um, it's a very hard problem to solve, and, and obviously if security was very easy, we wouldn't have conferences like this. Um, my, my, main, my main gripe with this whole thing is that I never thought that the research that we did um, what, for, for this meter was very thrilling, um, because replay attacks shouldn't be that easy. Um, and really that the system just, it, as I mentioned at the beginning, it doesn't seem like these were, were analyzed at all. Um, and hardware is inherently trusted and it shouldn't be. Yeah, absolutely. And I, if you want, you can also help solve this problem by riding a bicycle and uh, don't drive a car. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'd really like to thank Jennifer Granick and the EFF. Um, she probably has saved us many times in the past and will continue to do so in the future. Yes. We should all buy her flowers. Yeah. <laughs> she's um, great. She's, a, she's my personal hero. And I suppose we'll, we'll open up to Q&A until they pull us off the stage. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, the smart card shim um, yeah, is a completely yeah. generic device. I didn't even use any of the, the heart the components on the device. I just had the bare smart card circuit board. So if that's illegal, then that's a, a really bad thing for everybody. I didn't buy anything with credit cards on either, but I got sick and talked about it. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I guess everyone's leaving. So, anybody else have any questions? All right. Thank you. Anybody live in San Francisco? Here? No. no just, okay. just us. All right. No, there's one. Yeah. One. All right. Great. Well, well thank, thank you guys you. very much. Thank you. Okay.